This webinar is the first part of a series that covers heart sounds. The first series covers concepts such as hypertrophy, the generation of the normal heart sounds. Um, we'll also discuss auscultatory sites of where to listen for heart sounds. We will finish up the first part with an abnormal heart sound um, with a specific, specific valvular defect referred to as mitral valve prolapse. The second part will specifically cover four valvular defects that we will cover and also we will discuss some other ones but you'll have to just wait for the second part for that. So if we're going to start with in our, our discussion on heart sounds, I need to start with hypertrophy. This is the reason why. When we go over some valvular defects, as a response to an abnormal valve, there may be additional work placed upon the heart. And to compensate for the increased work, the various chambers of the heart may hypertrophy. Therefore, we're going to start with hypertrophy first. When we discuss the valvular defects, we'll then discuss what specific type of hypertrophy that we would get in a particular chamber in the heart in response to the increased work placed upon the heart. So let's talk about hypertrophy first. Now hypertrophy means refers to an increase in size of a cell. Hyperplasia means increase in number of cells. Now the heart or heart muscle or any or cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle responds or grows not by hyperplasia, but rather by hypertrophy. A hypertrophy can be a completely normal response or it can be due to some sort of disease condition. You will see hypertrophy in trained athletes. That's, that's an advantage to an extent. They can get uh, better cardiac outputs if they have some sort of hypertrophy in the heart, specifically left, the left ventricle. But um, but it also could be a response to some, some continued stress, such a disease condition. Now, one thing I do want to mention at, at this point is hypertrophy in response to a disease condition is a response of the heart to this continued stress to maintain efficiency. But at some point, it's not going to be a good thing because um, one of the things that you would have to have with increased size of the, the heart or heart muscle would be have a corresponding increase in circulation. And it doesn't necessarily increase in proportion to the increase in cell size, so you would not be able to meet the metabolic demands of the tissue. Also, what may happen if you get to a point where you have pathologic hypertrophy you may start to see an increase in connective tissue. And in this case, the increase in connective tissue would be by hyperplasia, which is an increase in number of cells. But we're talking about cells like fibroblasts, which would be that um, put down connective tissue. Now, over time, although hypertrophy may be, may be a, a, a good response to increased demands on the heart muscle, Continued stress, though, would it, may inevitably lead to the heart decompensating in the development of a cardiomyopathy. Now, what we're going to look at is first is look at types of hypertrophy that we get. Now, the type of hypertrophy that we'll see is determined by what part of the cardiac cycle in which the wall stress is increased. And in reality, the two types that we're going to discuss may both exist in the heart, but we're going to look at them in isolation. Now, the first type is eccentric hypertrophy, and this is a response to increased stress that's placed on the heart during diastole. So it's going to be the increased load is going to be a volume load. Concentric hypertrophy is a response to increased load placed upon the heart during systole. And so in this case, it's going to be a response to an increased pressure load or afterload. So let's look at concentric hypertrophy first. Now concentric hypertrophy, so you look at this picture here. Concentric hypertrophy is a response 
to an increased afterload, which is said, okay, the, the, the time in which the increased stress is placed on the heart is during systole. They have to generate higher pressures in order to get valves open and the blood moved out. So what will happen is you're going to have sarcomeres. They're going to be added in parallel. And what results as a response of that is the wall thickness increases. So you can generate higher pressures to get the valve open and the blood moved out perhaps against a higher pressure. The lumen size though, this is, the, this is a downfall. Over time, the lumen size can get small and you may have a problem being able to adequately fill enough blood into that chamber. So we'll think about a scenario. So we'll use this term, we'll use hypertension. If I've got systemic hypertension, we're going to say this is the left ventricle. This would be the aortic semilunar valve. Somewhere out here, the diastolic blood pressure is elevated. Say it's 100 millimeters of mercury instead of like the 80 millimeters of mercury. The left ventricle is going to have to create higher pressure to get this valve open and the blood out. In order to do that, it has to create greater tension. Well, to try to maintain efficiency in order to do that, you're going to add sarcomeres in parallel. And the sarcomeres, remember, are composed of actin and myosin. The number of cells haven't changed. You still have the same number of myofibers. It's just the myofibrils, which contain all the sarcomeres. You're adding more and more of that, more of this protein components. The wall thickness increases. Now, other examples that would cause this type of hypertrophy would be, say, the pulmonary hypertension. So in this scenario, this would be, say, the right ventricle. Some of the valvular defects. We will actually talk about aortic stenosis later. So if this valve is narrowed and it has to get the same amount of blood out against a smaller opening, we're going to have to create higher pressures to do that. Also, interestingly enough, we'll see this type of hypertrophy with severe isometric exercise. So this would be like what you would see where, and we're talking about okay, severe sustained, people that do like a lot of one rep max or they're, they're, they're holding something, they're doing static exercise, the, the pressures, your, your blood pressures get up extremely high. And what happens is over time, you can get concentric hypertrophy of the heart. Now the other type of hypertrophy that we may see is eccentric. So if you look at this chamber of the heart here, eccentric hypertrophy is a response to an increased work placed upon the heart and the work is preload. It's a volume load. Somehow that particular chamber of the heart has to accommodate more blood. Well in order to do that, there are going to be some changes within that heart chamber. In this case, sarcomeres are going to be added, and I didn't draw the sarcomeres in this one, but you're going to add sarcomeres in series, one after the other. What happens is the actual chamber size is going to increase to accommodate that blood. So you'll see the lumen size increase to accommodate an additional volume of blood. The wall will actually thin out, so because we call it dilation. Okay. So you don't have an increase in wall thickness. If anything, it thins out. We're adding sarcomeres in series. Now, you may see this type of hypertrophy with some of the valvular defects that we're going to discuss later, like aortic, you see aortic or mitral regurgitation, where the valve isn't closing when it should, so some blood comes back into the chamber. So it has this blood that went back into the chamber and then you have new blood coming in so it's got additional volume of blood it has to accommodate so you'll see this type of hypertrophy you'll also see it with some of the septal defects uh, a ventricular septal defect where there's a hole in the ventricular septum you'll have blood going over from the left side to the right side of the heart because of when you have that pressure difference during 
each, um, during systole, blood is going to go from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. You also will see this with chronic strenuous isotonic exercise. So this is someone that you'll see with like they're they're like the runners, the cyclists, and they never go out of training. You're gonna have they're gonna have higher blood volumes. They're gonna have to have little bit larger chambers to accommodate that blood volume. So to review, you've got two types of hypertrophy, concentric and eccentric. How do they differ? How are they the same? So you need to start thinking about that. How do they differ? What, they what type of stress that they respond to? What phase of the cardiac cycle is that increase in stress? Eccentric, it was during diastole. Concentric, it was systole. What happens to the chamber itself? Is, does the wall thickness change or not? Does the chamber itself change or not? How does it, what is this, how does it change? Are the sarcomeres added in series or are they added in parallel? And then what type of conditions would result in that particular type of hypertrophy. Now what we're going to do is start to discuss your heart sounds. And what is referred to is when you do cardiac auscultation. Auscultari is a Latin word that means to listen to. You'll be also doing auscultation for lung sounds. But we're going to do heart sounds. So remember I have this, this um, picture, this cartoon, because I think it's kind of funny because plenty of times They'll put a stethoscope on you and it's freezing cold. So make sure your stethoscope's a little bit warm before you place it on the in the patient. One thing to keep in mind when you do cardiac auscultation, it must be done on skin. You really should not do it through clothing. And that's in lab, it's required that you do it on skin and not through clothing. Now, cardiac auscultation is a very simple way of assessing heart function. You just listen through the chest wall, and it's been practiced for years and years and years. You can just put your ear onto a patient's chest wall and hear the S1, S2. But remember, you don't do that because the patient will never come back to you if you don't use an instrument such as a stethoscope. Okay? Now, the stethoscope is designed... We have a, if you have the one with the rotating headpiece, you have the designated diaphragm in the bell. And just a quick review right now is the diaphragm is listen, used to listen to high frequency sounds, and the bell is used to, look, to listen to low frequency sounds. So some just to keep in mind for later. Now, first, we've got to do some definitions. So I've written these here for you so you can fill in your notes. So, heart, a heart sound. Examples of your physiologic heart sounds would be your S1, your S2, your S3, and S4. Now, what creates sounds are vibrations. What creates the vibrations? Well, when we talk about heart sounds, is any turbulence that's created, that's associated with the heart, that will be tr transmitted up through the chest wall, up to the surface that where when you have your stethoscope, they're actually going to hear it. Now, a heart sound is considered to be normal. So it's heard at the right time when you're supposed to hear it. It's also would be considered it's the right duration. It's not too short or too long, or is it absent? And it's heard at the right intensity or like the loudness. So heart sounds are considered to be perfectly normal. Okay? We are going to review view the normal heart sounds today. A murmur, some people say heart murmur, but if I say murmur, such as a mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation or mitral stenosis, the ones that we are going to be discussing, a murmur is abnormal, considered to be abnormal. Again, it's turbulence, which creates vibrations. Now, they're associated with the heart, so a murmur is associated with the heart but it's heard at an inappropriate time. It is either, it can be heard at an inappropriate time, or it's an abnormal duration, or it's an abnormal intensity. 
the examples that we are going to give to you today, what they're going to have in common is they're heard at an inappropriate time. I should not hear sounds between S1 and S2. If I hear something between S1 and S2, that is not normal. So those are the ones that we're going to be discussing. Now the last one is called brewy. That's the appropriate pronunciation. It's not brew it, it's brewy. Now a brewy is something that you hear, but it's not associated with the heart. It's with a blood vessel in the periphery. Okay? So it's 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 not a coronary blood vessel, so it's got to be a vessel outside of the heart. So an aorta is out, considered outside the heart. Okay, so a blood vessel, the carotid would be an example. There's those again are turbulence, some sort of turbulent blood flow has created vibrations that then we can hear. So they're associated with the blood vessel or the periphery. A bruit is considered to be abnormal. So murmurs and bruits are abnormal. Heart sounds are normal. Now, in your notes, we have listed a number of different things. It, it says in your notes, I believe, mechanisms of heart sounds. But I'm going to change it to me mechanisms of things that can create turbulence or things that can create bruits or murmurs. So I have given you some examples of things that can create these, this abnormal turbulence. So if you have something that's obstructed, like a valve or a blood vessel, that blood is having a hard time getting through it, nice and uh, nice even flow, or we, we consider we call it laminar flow. If it's no longer laminar flow, it's turbulent flow. If you've got a aortic semilunar valve that's narrowed, it's aortic stenosis. Now, one thing that some people have confused, aortic stenosis is a stenotic aortic semilunar valve. It is not a narrowed aorta. Okay, so they, they don't call that that. So aortic stenosis is specifically refers to the semilunar valve. You may also say have a placking of an artery. So in the carotid, if you're listening to the carotid and you hear something, that could be due to an atherosclerotic plaque. Another example is um, I'm not going to go through all of these, so you can you can write them down. Um, we're definitely going to be talking about backwards flow or regurgitation. So if I have a semilunar valve doesn't, that doesn't close completely, that can create some turbulence, say it's in mitral regurgitation. Another example would be if you have abnormal shunting of blood. So VSD is short for ventricular septal defect. So if someone has a hole in the ventricular septum, you'll have an abnormal shunting of blood from the high pressure left ventricle into the right ventricle and you will hear a sound associated with that. My daughter was born with a ventricular septal defect. So a day or two after she was born, when the pediatricians came in and they listened to her heart, they heard it was extremely loud. And so they whisked away and tried it and then started doing a bunch of other tests on her. She since though when she was before she was five it closed. I have an atrial septal defect. In, in reality, it's not really an atrial septal defect. Is I have a patent forminal valley, which does create a murmur that can be heard by a cardiologist. Most other people can't hear it. Um, another one would be a patent ductus arteriosus, because you'll be hearing about that in the embryo section in gross anatomy. In fetal development, you do have a duct, the ductus arteriosus that connects the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. But after you're born, it needs to close. And if it doesn't close, it remains patent, you're going to get an abnormal shunting of blood. So these are just some examples of. I might as well mention this one because this is going to come, come into play next trimester. If someone's hyperthyroid, they're overproducing the thyroid hormones, the thyroid gland is very vascular. And with that, you're going to have a lot of blood flow going to and from the thyroid and you'll actually hear a sound if you place the stethoscope over the thyroid and it would be a bury with hyperthyroidism just because of increased rate of flow when someone's hyperthyroid. Now what we need to discuss next, which is going to, you're going to need to do this for lab, 
is to describe the areas, the escultatory areas, where you need to place the stethoscope to evaluate the valves. If you place the stethoscope in these particular sites, you can determine if something may be wrong. These are standard escultatory sites that you're going to listen to. There will be some variations, but I'm giving you this, this, the standard escultatory areas. One thing I want to bring to your attention, in the circles represents where you're going to place the stethoscope. The dark areas represents where the actual anatomic location of the valves would be. So why do you place the stethoscope somewhere else other than where the valves are? You need to keep in mind that the sounds associated with the valves have to pass through the pericardium, the surrounding tissues, the chest wall, and then the tissues and everything are going to muffle sounds, some more than others. So what happens is the placement of the stethoscope doesn't always correspond exactly to the position of the valve that we're going to review. But what you need to realize is that, or kind of keep in mind, is the sounds will be transmitted along the direction of blood flow. And that's something just to keep in mind. The sounds associated with the valves are going to follow the direction of where the blood is going. You need to try to remember where some of these sites are. You've got to think about your anatomy. So you can kind of see the heart right underneath here and where the ribs are. Okay, Review your anatomy a little bit. The heart's in the chest wall with the right part of the heart is more anterior. The apex is off to the left, okay? So it's kind of turned a little bit. The AV valves, okay, the mitral and tricuspid valves, they, the sculptatory site associated with, associated with them will tend to be transmitted in the direction of blood flow, so they're going to be more around where the ventricles are, okay? So they're kind of more located around where the ventricles are. The semilunar valve sounds, the aortic and pulmonary, they, the sounds associated with, with them are transmitted through their outflow tracts, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Now, you got to sit there and think about, okay, when I'm lo when the, looking at the heart, how, how do the blood vessels emerge from the heart? How does the pulmonary trunk emerge? How does the aorta, what direction do they go in? So let's start with the escultatory sites for the semilunar valves. So here, you'll notice on this diagram, the aortic semilunar valve, the escultatory site, is found at the second intercostal space to the right of the sternum. So here's a rib, here's a rib, here's a rib, here's a rib. So here's the first intercostal space, here's the second intercostal space you place the stethoscope just to the right of the sternum in the intercostal space. Do not place it on bone. You're not going to hear anything, so it must be in the intercostal space. So why is it to the right of the sternum? The aorta emerges and moves off to the right from the heart. That's why you go to the second intercostal space to the right. The pulmonary semilunar valve happens to be on the other side. It's again second intercostal space to the left of the sternum. Because the pulmonic trunk comes up off and a little bit to the left, that's why you're going to place it to the left. Now the mitral site, the mitral valve, is located right where the apex of the heart is. So in anatomical terms, it happens to be either the fourth or fifth, depending on the person. So here's one, two, three, four, and this one I have it on the fifth one. It's either the fourth or fifth intercostal space. It's to the left of the sternum, but not immediate. It's mid-clavicular line. So here's my clavicle, so it's mid-clavicular line. So it's fourth to fifth intercostal space, left of sternum, mid-clavicular line. Corresponds to where the apex of the heart is. The tricuspid site, now this one is variable. It is the fourth intercostal space. 
Okay, so you see one, two, three, fourth intercostal space to the right or left of sternum. So kind of a, a rule of thumb. Right of sternum, you tend to see that more if someone's kind of tall and skinny. Tends to be the left of the sternum if something someone's more short, a little shorter, or they gained a little bit of weight, a little overweight. Kind of think about if they're a little overweight, the, the, the fat in their belly pushes up against the diaphragm, up against the heart, and the heart gets pushed off more to the left. If they're tall and skinny, this tends to hang a little bit more vertical. So the, tr the tricuspid valve is fourth intercostal space, right or left of the sternum. So keep in mind, the mitral valve is the left of the sternum and can be in the fourth intercostal space, but it is to the midclavicular line. It's much further over, kind of around the nipple line, okay? And what we're going to be doing is when it'll be looking at your normal heart sounds first. So here's S1, here's S2, here's S3, and here's S4. What I'm showing you is a picture that, from your textbook, Guyton. It's a phonocardiogram. So it's a visual depiction of heart sounds. Remember, some sounds may be inaudible to the human ear, like S3 and S4. So here we can see it. I want to show you this just so you can see during kind of reference of when you hear S1, S2, S3, and S4 corresponding to phases of the cardiac cycle. And also, you're going to see some of the valvular defects that we're going to talk about um, a little bit later. So one thing I want you to kind of keep look at. Here's S1. It, it begins at the start of systole, which happens to be isovolemic contraction. S2 is heard at the beginning of diastole, which happens to be isovolemic relaxation. So if you hear something between S1 and S2, like you see here with aortic stenosis, they're going to classify that as a systolic murmur. So this is where it's important to remember your cardiac cycle stuff. When is S1? When is S2? S1 signifies the beginning of systole. S2 signifies the beginning of diastole. Now you'll notice that S3 and S4 are just barely blips here. So they're not very loud sounds at all. And they happen to be heard during diastole because this is during rapid inflow. And S4 is during atrial systole. You'll also notice the intensity of the sounds. S1 is louder and lasts longer than S2, 3, or 4. Okay. So let's review your normal heart sounds. So S1 and S2. So let's fill in your notes. Some of the stuff you already know. S1 is created when what valves close? So S1 is when the AV valves close. When that happens, get blood closing the valves, but then getting redirected down to the bottom of the heart, creates turbulence, which then we can hear. So S1 is created by closure of the semilunar valves signifies the beginning of systole. It is um, loudest, the auscultatory site. You can hear it. I mean, you put your stethoscope in any part of your heart or chest wall, as long as it's not on bone, you're going to hear it. But where it's the loudest is towards the apex, is at the, at the um, mitral site. The sound characteristic or characteristics, it's considered to be a medium frequency sound, and it's, it's high enough, I mean medium is enough that you can hear it best with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. Now it's also the loudest and the longest of your physiologic heart sounds, okay? S2 is caused by closure of the AV valve, oh sorry, sorry, it's not closure of the AV valves. S2 is closure of the semilunar valves. When that happens, 
you start isovolumic relaxation, so it signifies the beginning of diastole. So when this, the blood comes back, closes the valve, and then the blood kind of gets redirected, creates a lot of turbulence that you can hear it. The escultatory site is um, it's best heard over the base of the heart, which would be either the aortic or pulmonic area. The sound characteristics, it's high frequency, so it's best, again, heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. It's shorter duration, lower intensity than S1, because the semilunar valves are just a lot cleaner when they close. Remember that the AV valves are floppy and sloppy. Now, I'm not sure if this wave file is going to work. So we'll see. So you can you're going to hear someone's heart sounds. So you hear you're hearing lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up. Every once in a while, I get people that are like, "Well, how do you know which one's S1, S2?" Well, if someone's got a arresting normal resting heart rate, the duration between S1 and S2 is shorter than S2 to the next S1 because we spend more time in diastole. So it's S1, S2 is a little bit shorter than S2 to S1 is a little bit longer. If someone's got a fast heart rate, how you can distinguish between the two is if you're feeling their pulse. When you actually feel the pulse, that corresponds to S1. So that's a little trick that you can remember. The next one, or before we do S3, I want to talk about S2 just a little bit more. We can get what we call splitting of S2. So I have to kind of backtrack a little bit. When you hear S1 and S2, it's closure of both the corresponding valves, either closure of the semilunars or closure of the AV, pretty close together. So S2 was this closure of the semilunar valves, the aortic and the pulmonic semilunar valve. They close close enough in time that the human ear picks up just one sound. But if you can delay closure or of one of the valves enough with enough time, a human ear will pick up two distinct sounds. And I'm going to give you an example where this occurs physiologically, I'll give you the mechanism behind it. So splitting of S2 can happen during inspiration. It's the only one you're going to hear is during a deep inspiration. So here's the mechanism why. So when you take a big breath in, when you take a big breath in, one of the things it does is it increases your venous return. It brings more blood to the right side of the heart. This is a normal way we can get blood back to heart, just insp inspiring. So we're going to have more blood going into the right atrium. Well, simultaneously, because of the increase in, um, or the in inspiration, what happens is that the negative pressure in the lungs makes blood vessels in the lungs expand, increasing their, their capacity for blood. So what happens is the blood in the lungs itself, or the blood vessels, expand and accommodate more blood. So what happens is less blood goes to the left atrium, just a little bit. Don't think it's like it's don't freak out about this. It, it's just a, a tiny bit less. So you got more blood to the right side, less blood to the left side. Okay. So what happens? I got more blood going to the right side of the heart. Right atria, got to go out the right ventricle, and then out to the pulmonary trunk. So I have to delay closure of the pulmonic valve just a little bit to get that more blood out. Simultaneously, because I have less blood going the left side of the heart, 
left atria, less blood to the left ventricle, a little bit less blood out to the aorta, I can close the aortic valve a little bit sooner. So what you see here on this picture, you're seeing the aortic valve closing sooner than the pulmonic valve enough that when you do listen to sounds, you're going to hear two distinct sounds instead of one. Because under normal conditions, when you're expiring, this, the valves close close enough together that the human ear can't distinguish between the sounds. So they just hear one sound. So you'll have the splitting of S2 during an inspiration, not during an expiration. Now, it does the degree of splitting does vary with age. And what we're going to pretty much we always discuss is adults. So you get the splitting on inspiration. Old people, you may not necessarily hear the split. Children, you may hear it on inspiration and expiration. It's a complicated story. But we're talking about you guys are normal adults. You should be able to perhaps hear the splitting on inspiration. So see if this, this uh, sound file will work. play again for you. So you hear the lub and then the dub is like bleh, like just two little sounds. Just faintly you can hear two distinct sounds. Now S3 is a considered a normal heart sound, physiologic heart sound. It is created or heard during the period of rapid inflow. We said it was a filling sound. Now I'm going to tell you what they believe is what creates all that turbulence that is that you may hear in S3. So what happens during rapid inflow, you get this passive filling of the ventricles with about like 70-80% of blood that was in the aorta. I mean a lot of blood is going to come in those ventricles during rapid inflow. At towards the tail end of that stage, as kind of the ventricles kind of get to the their point of, you know, getting to the max of where they can kind of expand initially, they stop. The ventricles kind of they're expanding and then they kind of stop. Well, the the blood then kind of gets sloshed around. So the kinetic energy of the blood's movement is then converted to vibration. So it just starts sloshing around. And sometimes the vibrations that are created by that turbulence can be heard. Now, S3 is not always heard. That's why we had the phonocardiogram. But one thing that to, to keep in mind for S3, I'm going to give you instances of where you're more, more likely to hear it or it's more likely to be audible. So if you kind of notice, like it's because of this filling of the blood into the ventricle, get to the limits of kind of expanding out, and then it stops, the ventricle stops expanding, and the blood gets sloshed around, It'll this will make sense. So, you're more likely to have an audible S3 if you've got a lot of blood coming in, or two, the ventricle emptied poorly previously, so it's already kind of expanded out, and then you're putting more blood in there. So those are the two instances where you're more likely to have an audible S3. That's going to be important in just a moment. So let's fill in your notes. The cause we said was filling of the ventricles. That happens during rapid inflow. The sculptatory site. It's best heard down towards the apex of the heart because it's a filling sound. It's going towards the ventricle. So it's more likely it could be heard down with the uh, tricuspid site or the mitral site. Generally it's loudest at the mitral site. The two may change if we've got something abnormal going on. I'm going to give you an instance in a moment. So some not towards the where the AV valve sites are. The sound characteristic. This is low frequency. Okay, so it's a low frequency sound, means it's best heard with the bell of the stethoscope. It is um, not very loud, 
And what it's referred to as is a gallop rhythm. So this is why they call it gallop, like a gallop of a horse. You can, if you get like a tripling of the heart sounds, it sounds like a canter of a horse. Lub dub dub, lub dub dub, lub dub dub. So that's kind of like like a canter or the gallop of a horse. You would hear it shortly after S2. So it's lub dub dub, lub dub dub. Okay, so that's when you would hear it shortly after S2. Well, here is some examples of when S3 may or not be referred to as a physiologic heart sound. Okay. S3 is completely normal under these conditions. If it falls out of these conditions, it's no longer considered a physiologic heart sound. S3 is audible. So we're talking about audible S3 because everybody has an S3, but whether or not it's audible. It's often heard in children and young adults because due to the larger motions of their hearts, the thinner chest walls. So that's perfectly normal to hear it in children and young adults. It should disappear in your 30s. Okay? So it should disappear in your 30s. Once you get past 40, you shouldn't hear it unless, here's the other ones, you also, S3 is most likely to be heard in endurance athletes due to their large volumes, large stroke volumes. They're going to have a lot of blood going into those ventricles. The other example that would be considered normal would be it's very common to have an audible S3 in the third trimester of pregnancy just again due to the large volume. Cardiac outputs are high, the fluid volume is high in pregnant women. So if you have an audible S3 and you're not an endurance athlete or pregnant and over 40, it's no longer physiologic. We're going to call it a different name. What it's going to be referred to as a ventricular diastolic gallop. So if I write on an exam ventricular diastolic gallop, that's automatically abnormal. That is an abnormal S3. If I have example that this would happen, would be, we gave you the two things where you more likely have an audible S3, a lot of blood coming in, or the ventricle poorly emptied. Okay, so if I have heart failure, generally often, first sign of heart failure is an audible S3. So if the heart's not pumping effectively, you may have a S3. If you've got some of the valvular defects, that can lead to an audible S3. So the where it's going to be heard the loudest will depend on what um, valve is defective, or again, or also could have um, be determined by which ventricle. If you have heart failure, you can have left ventricular heart failure or you also may have right ventricular heart failure. So if I have right ventricular heart failure, that S3 is probably going to be heard loudest at the, at the tricuspid site. If I have left ventricular heart failure, it's going to be heard loudest at the mitral site. Okay? S4, oh, let's go back because you didn't hear the S3. So I hope you can hear S3. It's again, it's these, it's, I don't know if you'll be able to hear these as much. You might have to turn up your computer. So let's hear it again. So you hear lub dipped up, lub dipped up. S4 is our last physiologic heart sound. You already should know that S4 is a filling sound. It is heard during atrial systole. And the cause, very similar, the mechanism what creates the sound is very similar to what we talked about with S3. It's a filling sound, so blood's coming in, but here's the, the, the slight difference. This is during the late, late part of diastole. 
where the atrial are going to contract and re pump the remaining 20% of that blood into the ventricle. But here, this is atrial contraction in people who have got diminished ventricular compliance. So the ventricles are not as stretchy as they used to be. You're like, well, uh, if my ventricles aren't compliant, that's not normal. Why is this a physiologic heart sound? This is something that is, as you get older, your ventricles do become less compliant, just normal fact of aging. So if you have an, an older patient who is, like, say, over 50 years of age, an audible S3 may be heard as long as everything else is fine. That's not going to be considered pathologic. But if you have an audible S3 in someone who's less than 50, it is definitely pathologic. So it's saying something is causing the ventricles to become less compliant or stiffer. It could be any of our valvular defects that we discuss. Um, it could be from coronary artery disease. It could be from high blood pressure. So a lot of different things can result in that. So you may have an S4 if someone's less than 50, but that's no longer considered physiologic. Here, this is what we're going to call it. We'll call it an atrial diastolic gallop. So again, if I say atrial diastolic gallop, that is not normal. Other than that, S4 is considered normal. Where is it heard the best? What's the escultatory site? S4, again, most, most um, or it's going to be heard the loudest is at the apex. But again, most of the time it's not heard. S4 is almost impossible to be heard under normal conditions. It's so low frequency and it's so low in, in its intensity. So sound characteristics is a low frequency sound, very limits of audibility. Most time you will not hear it. So it's best heard because it's low frequency with the bell. When would you hear it in respect to S1 and S2? Well, since S4 is during atrial systole, it's going to be heard shortly before S1. So just before S1 is when you'd hear S4. Let's see if we can hear it. So let's try it. Let's try it again. So you heard da 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 da. So the first two sounds you heard was the S4, S1, and then a little bit of pause, then you heard S2. Do you realize, though, that someone may have a quadrupling of the heart sounds, where it's, everything's audible in S1, S2, S3, and S4? If, that, if you've got quadrupling of the heart sounds, they're messed up. Because if you hear S3 and an S4, mm, Probably not, not, not a good sign. Now what we'll be doing in the second part of the webinar is going to be looking at systolic and also diastolic murmurs. There are murmurs that are considered to be continuous, so that means you hear them throughout the cardiac cycle. Pet and ductus arteriosus is a perfect example of that. The Systolic murmurs are heard during systole, so you see them here. The diastolic murmurs are heard during diastole, hence the name diastolic murmurs. What I want to do is discuss just one abnormal or one valvular defect that is not covered in guidance, but I want to cover it because it's a fairly common defect. And then it'll be the end of this part of the webinar. Second part of the webinar is when we're going to go over specifically some of the uh, valvular defects other than mitral valve prolapse. So mitral valve prolapse, it is one of the most common valvular disorders and it affects anywhere from like 3 to 10% of the population. A, lot, a good amount of females, this affects females more often, they say about 6% of all females have mitral valve prolapse. Um, Mitral valve prolapse, though, doesn't always cause problems with people. There's a lot of people with it. It doesn't cause them any, any 
any, uh, what's the word, uh, reduced quality of life, things like that. I'll give you examples where they would need to try to fix it. Now, what, why do they call it mitral valve prolapse? Prolapse literally means to fall out of place. So if I have a um, prolapsed uterus, my uterus can actually drop out of place and doesn't sound very lovely, but it can actually drop down through the vagina. Okay, so that means to fall out of place. What happens is, is the valve, when during systole, okay, during systole, when the ventricles are contracting, blood moves up and should close the valve. But what happens with the mitral valve, it kind of puffs up a little bit, falls out of place. Now, some people have a milder case of it where this is all that they have. What you hear with this is what we call a mid-systolic mid click. So during mid-systole, you hear a click sound. And that what it corresponds to is the um, snapping or the tensing of the everted cusp. So these kind of snap, come back down because the chordae tendini are or the papillary muscles contract and it pulls down the chordae tendon it's trying to put, pull it back a little bit. They're a little bit more floppy than normal. There's a lot of things that can cause that mitral valve to kind of prolapse. So what you're hearing is it kind of coming back. That's in mild cases. In severe cases, the, the valve prolapses enough that some blood goes back into the atria and you have some regurgitation. So with the severe mitral valve prolapse, you can have accompanying regurgitation. So you hear the mid-systolic click followed by a murmur that happens in late systole. So you'll get regurgitant blood flow. This defect can be caused from just development. During, during development of the, of the baby, that the valve uh, developed abnormally. It's a little bit bigger than it should be. It can be something again that the child's born with but not because of abnormal development but something they inherited. Marfan syndrome is a condition where um, they can have these defective valves because Marfan syndrome affects collagen and co collagen is a component of your valves. It could be a result of having rheumatic fever as a child. Also, this can be something that happens, say, late in life. If you have, say, an infarction in the heart that affect the papillary muscles, well, papillary muscles need to contract to pull on those chordae tendini to keep that valve down. So that can happen if you've got something that affects the papillary muscle function. It could be just a matter of, during development, the chordae tendini are a little longer than they should. That could happen. The mitral valve prolapse, like if, I, if someone has the milder one, nothing, there's nothing they're going to do for them. If it's, you get enough regurgitant blood flow, they may have to go in and repair the valve. Most patients with that prolapse um, are not symptomatic and sometimes just found in a routine exam. Some percentage of people with this have chest pain that mimics the angina. They get some fatigue, they get problems breathing, and some, a small percentage, have some psychiatric manifestations like anxiety reactions or depression. I don't know what the correlation is. I have no idea. My oldest sister has mitral valve prolapse and she does have anxiety. Um, issues with it and she does every once in a while get some chest pain associated with the mitral valve prolapse. They, um, unless they don't have any problems, um, they don't, obviously surgery is not warranted. Sometimes uh, if they have it, um, but other than that, they don't usually do that much for mitral valve prolapse unless it's um, very severe. This is the end of the first part of the webinar series. Second one is going to be entitled Valvular Lesions.